the 100th Open at Lytham in 1971, and record crowds came to marvel at the flair and charm of the main contenders. Once again, Jacqueline, Nicholas, Trevino, and unknown Taiwanese Liang Huan Lu, who was quickly renamed just Mr. Lu. I've known Mr. Lu since I was uh, 17 years old. Mr. Lu was in the uh, Taiwanese uh, National Air Force. And I was in the 3rd Marine Division uh, at Okinawa, Marine. And I was on the 3rd Marine Division golf team. And we played an inter-service match with him. He beat me 10 and 8. 10 and 8 he beat me. I will never forget it as long as I live. We had a very, very nice stroll. We had a nice conversation. I started out on fire. I think I birdied four of the first five or five of the first six. And Mr. Lou walks over to me and he says, uh, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee. I said, what happened? He said, uh, you want to go through? You play by yourself, I play behind you. <laughs> I drove it right down the middle of the fairway, just opposite the bunker there. And the ball was running quite a bit there. I can't see if he wins, we're going to have a lot of flat lights next week. <laughs> and then uh, Mr. Lou drove it. Almost in the bunker, do you remember he had to stand in the bunker to hit it? Hits the ball in the heel and hits the lady in the forehead. Mr. Lou knocked some lady out on the last hole and bounced in the middle of the fairway and got up and in to, f to, to beat me out of second place. He hits eight iron, six feet from the hole, ends up making birdie. I hit my six iron to the back of the green. I putted it down. Do you remember I, I won with, with the small ball there? I thought that it was. It was like cheating, putting with a small ball, you know, because it weighs the same, except the circumference of it is smaller. So if you catch any parts of the hole, I mean, it just goes in the cup. And I got a tremendous amount of confidence putting with this ball. Both opens that I won, I won with a small ball. It was only fitting that Jacqueline and Trevino played together at the past Champions Challenge. Trevino's chatter around the course and impossible good fortune made him a formidable partner. Never more so than in 1972, Trevino was returning to Muirfield as defending champion. We got lost. And we were trying to find Gifford, in other words. That's where the Yester house was at. But once I got in there, I'll never forget the gentleman that owned it. Beautiful garden. And it was just, the lawn was just, goes forever. And I asked him, I said, do you mind if I had balls there? Never, he'd never played golf before. He says, oh, there's no problem. So you know me, I'm taking those divots. <laughs> He's standing there in the window going, what are you doing? Trevino was the man. He was the guy who was defending. He'd won the year before. And, you know, I was there with him, keeping an eye on him and staying with him all the time. I probably played some of the best golf there. And uh, that was, you know, fate. I mean, Lee's week. I mean, what he did there with the chip-ins and, uh, and I was parted. I mean, he finished with five birdies in the third round and uh, I matched him three out of the five. I stayed with him all the next day and gradually I felt was grinding him down to the point where he hit a hook off 17 into the bunker, which, you know, that told me a lot. Uh, as you don't see him hit hooks. I went to the tee, I put it in the ground, I take one, I fixed to hit the ball, and you know, you know how I used to pat the left foot, and I read it, and here comes a guy with a camera, television camera. I don't know if it was BBC, I, I don't know who he was, but anyway, he had the handheld camera, and he's walking right in front of the tee. So I pull back, and I said, man. So I get behind it, I line it up, I get that, I pat the left foot, and now here comes the guy with the tripod. I, I, I lost my concentration, and then I pulled it in the bunker. So I then hit it right down, just short of the green on the left, and no problem. And he hooked it again, further be behind where I was, I think. I hit the chip, I hit it too strong. Went over, in other words, in the rough, I just passed the pin. So Tony says, listen, he says, you go ahead if you want. I don't blame him, I would have said the same thing. I go over there and I look at the ball. Willie puts the bag down, I grab a 9-9. I chip the ball, goes in the hole. He hit the shot at 17 that uh, it's almost like a, a give up shot. I mean, he, didn't, he really didn't even uh, look at it. He just went up and hit it and then went in the hole. Oh, chips in. And of course, my fault was my reaction. 
was, was my immediate reaction, you son of a gun, you're not going to beat me like that. And I took a rush at my pot. Well, right there, you can see what happened to Tony. And then he putted the ball, and he, he hit it too hard. He was trying to make the putt. That's what he was trying to do. I know that. Champions are like that. Tony, I, I can tell, I could read his mind. Tony was probably saying, you SOB, I'm not going to let you beat me like that. The hindsight's got 20-20 vision. I mean, I could have rolled the putt to the side of the hole and maybe hold it on that basis, but I, you know, took, took that attitude and ran, uh, ran it, you know, two and a half, three feet by. Trevino was... Uh, yeah, I never know what he's thinking sometimes. I mean, Lee's a, an amazing guy. He's, uh, he's a wonderful player. He's always been a wonderful player. But sometimes he, he does things either, either out of nerves or, or uh, impulse or what. It was a pre pretty spectacular finish. The next year, and watching in the crowd, a young star of the future. It was true in 73, and he said, let's go to the Open. And so we... Crumbs, we carted up the good old M6 in pouring rain and stayed in a tent in a field and uh, and went to the Troon Open, which then was great. As a, as a kid, I was, you know, I had a free run. I could run around from tea to fair. I could watch them all play, and I, and I loved it. I sat on the back of the practice ground and watched all these guys practice all day. And so I used to just arrive and disappear all day and meet my dad at the end of the day, and that was... That was really my, my start of my love for the Open. And the winner. Everyone waits to see if Weisskopf will crack. And there's Weisskopf's son. The conditions at Troon in 73 could not have happened at a better time for me. I had just won three tournaments and um, I was playing extremely well. And I got to the course a week ahead of time and played many pra practice rounds with Jack and Arnold, uh, Tony Jacklin, Bert Yancey, and the course was hard and fast. And I came out that last round and really played flawlessly, to tell you the truth. I was just on my game and, you know, it, thank God it happened that week, you know. Weisskopf, that was a good one, wasn't it? I watched him practice in his street shoes. He came down one evening, he was hitting balls in his slippery street shoes, you know, his leather sole shoes. And I thought, this guy's a bit good. And, you know, and I followed Weisskopf all the way. So that was a good call. And then the next year at, um, at Lytham, actually I arrived and walked straight onto the golf course, got to the third hole and saw Gary hit a three iron in practice to, to, to a foot. And I thought, well, he'll do well this week. So I, I had to be honest, I was two for two after for my picks. I should have been... Uh, so I'm sure my dad was cursing me. I didn't, didn't tell him to go and put a pound.